Welcome to Witch Hunt, the podcast bringing you the most in-depth coverage of the Salem Witch Trials. I'm Josh Hutchinson. And I'm Sarah Jack. Today, we are excited to present the second episode in the Salem Witch Hunt 101 series. We're taking a different approach to this one. I'll be telling a narrative of the events of early 1692. And I'm hearing this telling of the story for the very first time, just like everyone watching or listening. Yeah, I've really kept this one under wraps from you, so I can't wait to hear your reactions to it. I can't wait to hear what you've done with your story. Scene 1, Salem Village, Massachusetts Bay Colony, February 1692. The girl flitters across the room, chirping like a bird. Abigail Williams, the minister's niece and ward, aged 11, has been acting strangely lately. Perhaps a winter's confinement in a frigid house has given her cabin fever. Maybe she's just restless. A preteen in the boring 17th century? Abigail has been orphaned and lives in the care of her relative, Salem Village Minister Samuel Paris, who is known as her uncle, though the exact relationship is unclear. Paris's daughter Elizabeth, called Betty, is at this moment on all fours under a table, barking like a dog while alternately complaining of terrible pain. Earlier, she had honked like a goose and soared through the air, all the way across the parsonage's great hall. Nobody had seen her toes touching the ground. They'd all been fixated on the honking and flapping, which would have been hard to ignore. Now Samuel Paris paces the floor, following Abigail, constantly praying as he walks behind her. Maybe the girls are ill, but if they are, what manner of illness causes these antics? Whatever it is, the minister has had enough of it. How can anyone expect him to write each week's sermon in this environment? He abruptly stops following Abigail. I have to get this sermon done, Elizabeth, he says to his wife, the former Elizabeth Eldridge. I'm going to Ingersoll's. It'll be quieter there. Quieter at Ingersoll's? Well, I'm sure he'd let you use one of his rooms. The minister goes to his desk and grabs his material and Bible. Looking at the ice just forming atop the ink, he says, warmer at Ingersoll's too. Why don't you see if he has any more wood to spare? He doesn't. He's already given us our share. It's those unregenerate types that are withholding. Samuel Paris strides to the door and steps out, letting the door swing shut hard behind him. Betty jumps, striking her head on the bottom of the table. She rubs the sore and then crawls out from underneath, now whimpering like a scolded puppy. Maybe she and her cousin are ill, but strangely, nobody in that house nobody else in the household has been acting anything but normal. Why has the illness not touched Betty's siblings, Thomas and Susanna? Why not Tituba or John? Why not Elizabeth Paris Senior, who seems to always be sick with something or other? Maybe the girls have succumbed to the pressures facing the Paris household this long, gold winter. They received a fraction of the firewood they need to live comfortably, and Samuel often finds himself writing his sermons at Ingersoll's, or sometimes the nearby Walcott home, or even Thomas Putnam's house. With the minister under intense pressure, that may have rubbed off on some of the children. So the minister has prayed for weeks, but nothing in the girls' conditions has improved. They still contort into strange shapes, impossible to be caused by any known natural illness. They writhe in agony and cry out of pain. Samuel knows many of the villagers have turned their backs on him. But this seems more sinister, more diabolical. Or is it God's judgment on him? No, it can't be personally against him. He's doing the best anyone can. Maybe it is to address the sins of the community collectively. If praying isn't working, maybe a fast will be necessary. He will preach another impassioned sermon on Sunday, reminding his congregation of the constant presence of the devil who lurks about the village, as he does any place where such a beacon of godliness as Samuel Paris dwells. Monday, Samuel will hold a private fast. It is the devil who has poisoned men's minds against Samuel's ministry. And if there were ever a time for evil to gain a foothold in the village, he knows it is in this period of division. Samuel has to keep up his sermons and has to warn the villagers 
before it is too late. You will have to alert area pastors too, but maybe it's time for them to come over anyways to hold a significant fast. Alas, the cold numbs Samuel Paris's mind as he walks the short distance to Ingersoll's next door. What is he trying to get at in his sermons this week again? Samuel pulls the front door open and steps inside Nathaniel Ingersoll's Ordinary, a tavern that does quite well for itself with its central location in the village and its close proximity to the meeting house. Come Sunday, this place will be absolutely packed between the two services. Nathaniel Ingersoll stands at the back of the room, discussing something with his adopted son, Benjamin Hutchinson, who helps out around the tavern. Samuel closes the door behind himself, and the two other men break off their conversation. Nathaniel says, Good day, Samuel. And Benjamin says, Good morning, Reverend. Will you be needing a room again? I would be indebted to you. Nathaniel says, Think nothing of it. Room's just sitting there unoccupied. Thank you, Samuel says. There's a ruckus at the house again. I figured as much, Nathaniel says. Benjamin leads Samuel upstairs and opens a door. Samuel enters and closes the door behind himself. He will be in here all day, except for meals and trips to the privy out in the yard. On Sunday morning, with his sermon written, Samuel Paris leads his family the short distance from their home to the meeting house. Entering, they once again find this building even colder than the house they left. There's no fireplace here. There's no grand hearth for cooking and warming. Measuring a modest 34 by 28 feet, the wooden meeting house features a gallery to help fit the many, many people who worship here. And there's a place today that people can visit a replica of the meeting house. Yes, if you go to the Rebecca Nurse Homestead, you get a replica built to the exact dimensions that were recorded in the Salem Village record book. It's quite remarkable to go in there and see a pulpit just like the one Samuel Paris would have preached at. On January 3rd, Samuel had preached that Christ having begun a new work, it is the main drift of the devil to pull it all down. Today, February 14th, he will warn the church of the dangers of division and devilry. It's a woeful piece of our corruption in an evil time when the wicked people and the godly party meet with vexations by and by to lay down divine providence as if God has forsaken the earth and there were no prophet in his service. His vitriol is largely directed at those in the village who oppose him. They've challenged his ownership of the parsonage and his role as a minister. The village voted to withhold his pay and firewood, and once Joseph Hutchinson, a village committee member who had donated the land for the meeting house, fenced the building in. Now, for those of you keeping track, Joseph Hutchinson was the birth father of Benjamin Hutchinson, who he'd put in the care of the Ingersolls, who had lost their only daughter. Joseph himself had seven sons and four daughters, so obviously had a kid to spare for the Ingersolls. Today, Paris will also speak of the present low condition of the church in the midst of its enemies. Non-Christians have inhabited this continent since time immemorial, and now those French Catholics to the north are encroaching again with the aid of their Wabanaki allies. Monday morning, Samuel Paris rises well before dawn with the rest of his household. Betty and Abigail persist in their afflictions. Samuel needs medical advice, but first he will turn to the ministers. He sits at his desk and breaks out his writing materials, but the ink is frozen overnight again. Elizabeth, Samuel says, warm this ink for me. She takes the inkwell and places it in a pot which she hangs over the low fire. In a few minutes, she returns the ink to her husband. The inkwell is warm to his touch. He sets it on his desk and draws ink into his pen. John, Samuel says, now handing John a paper. Take this letter to Nathaniel's. He needs to send messengers to the local ministers to ask them to meet me here as soon as they all can attend to see the girls. John takes the note and departs. 
Samuel and family spend the rest of the day amidst numerous interruptions by the girls, fasting and praying, but the girls do remain unwell and continue to behave strangely. On February 24th, Paris sends John on another errand. This time, he is to retrieve Salem Village's only physician, William Griggs, who lives some distance down the road. After Griggs examines the girl, he pulls Samuel aside for a conversation. They're under an evil hand, he says. You're sure it isn't anything medical? Absolutely, this affliction is not natural. Then Satan is after me. I'm afraid so. In the parsonage and around the village, talk turns to witches. Perhaps the girls were bewitched by one of Satan's agents. Christ knew there were devils in his church. On February 25th, Samuel and Elizabeth Paris travel for the Thursday Lecture, a weekly event hosted by various neighboring communities on a rotating schedule. While they are away, a neighbor, Mary Sibley, stays with the children. Mary Sibley speaks with Tituba and John. Here's what we're going to do, she says. Tituba, you collect some urine from Betty and Abigail. John, get the rye flour. What do you have in mind, Tituba asks. We're going to stop a witch. With urine. By baking a special cake, the girl's urine is needed so we can burn off some of the magic that the witch put in them. Soon, Tituba collects the urine of the girls, and John retrieves the heavy sack of rye flour while Elizabeth gathers the rest of what they'll need. The three adults meet at the hearth and bake the cake, with the girls wailing in agony behind them and contorting again into several bizarre shapes. After John removes the cake from the oven, Mary calls for the family dog, who eagerly devours the morsel. According to English custom, this witch-finding technique will reveal the identity of the woman who has afflicted the girls. Mary isn't exactly sure how, but her own mother taught her to do this. Maybe the witch will be hurt, or maybe she'll turn up at the door. Now, the same day the witch cake is baked, two more village girls become afflicted. Anne Putnam Jr. is the daughter of Paris ally Mr. Thomas Putnam Jr. and Mrs. Anne Carr Putnam. Thomas and the two Anne's have made several visits to the parsonage since Betty and Abigail have been ill. And I want to throw in that Thomas Putnam was also a sergeant in the local militia, serving under Lieutenant Nathaniel Ingersoll and Captain Jonathan Walcott, who are also important characters in the Salem Witch Hunt story. Now, another visitor who's taken ill is Elizabeth Hubbard an orphan teenage girl living with her relatives, the Griggses. She has also visited the parsonage along with the physician, whom she serves as maid. At 17, Hubbard is five years older than Anne Putnam Jr., making her the oldest person yet afflicted and the first of legal age to be able to bear witness in court. Her age lends credence to witchcraft accusations against villagers Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne whom Hubbard accuses of attacking her spectrally, which is to say the shapes of the women appear to her. They do not visit bodily. Everyone knows witches have the ability to leave their bodies and travel great distances to torment their victims. The girl writhes, twisting and turning, shouting at the top of her lungs, They got me! Who got you? Thomas Putnam Jr. asks. I don't know, but it hurts! It hurts! Make it stop! It's okay, Annie. You'll be fine. God is with you always. It's not okay. I won't be fine. What makes you say that? I feel like my bowels are being torn out. We are praying as hard as we can. It's not enough. Then we'll fast. No, I'm being pinched and pricked and choked right now. Don't you see that? How do you fast that away? I'm sorry, Annie, but you know the best weapon is prayer. The, the best weapon that we have in this spiritual battle. What's wrong with me, Father? I wish I knew. Is it natural? No, there is something very dark in this village. The spectral figure of a woman approaches Anne, holding out a little red book and a red pen. Take it, she says. Sign the book and you'll be free from your troubles. 
And if I don't, then we'll kill you. Father, save me. Your father won't save you. Nobody will. God, preserve me. Just sign the book and you'll be free from your guilt, worry, and pain. What book is that? My God gave it to me. And who is your God? You know who I mean, girl. A stabbing pain tears through Anne's chest. God save me, she says. Annie, Annie, Thomas Putnam is calling. After a moment, Anne snaps too. The spectral woman has gone away with her book. But Anne just knows she'll be back. Thomas Putnam shakes his daughter. Are you all right? No, father. A woman came to me with a book and said she'd kill me if I didn't sign it. What woman? I don't know, but it is none of God's book. It is the devil's book, for aught I know. What woman? I couldn't make out her face. But you must have seen her before. She had a familiar aspect. How did she get in here? I didn't see anyone come in. She appeared spectrally from thin air. A witch. I think so. I knew it. But how? This explains everything. Mercy! Panting, Maid Mercy Lewis enters the room. Sir, she says, run and get my brother Edward. Tell him a witch has assaulted Annie. Mercy turns and strides away to the stairs. A moment later, the front door squeaks open and promptly slams shut. Footsteps ascend the stairs, and Mother ducks into the garret. What's all this about a witch, then, she asks. Annie twists and whines. Look at Annie, Thomas says. A witch has done this. How do you know it's a witch? She saw a shape. What shape? A woman. Annie groans. What do you think this means? Witchcraft in our village? Yes, and they say the minister's girls are bewitched as well. Oh dear, after they've been sick for so long, why do they suddenly suspect a witch? I don't know, but that's all anyone could talk about when I was over this morning. I suppose we'd better fetch Griggs in Paris to tell us if I'm right. I'll send Mercy as soon as she gets back from Edwards. No, I want to go now. I'll saddle the horse. What shall I do while you're gone? Pray, he says. And mind she doesn't hurt herself. God send you back to us safely. Sometime later, Thomas returns home to find his brother Edward and neighbor Henry Kinney in the Great Hall, praying over Annie, while Anne Sr., Mercy Lewis, and Mercy's sister Priscilla Kinney hover over the afflicted girl. When the door shuts, the people in the room stop and turn to Thomas. What's the news? Edward Putnam says. Where's the minister? Anne Putnam Sr. asks. Where's Griggs? Henry Kinney asks. Griggs's girl is afflicted, too. She also complains of women assaulting her. Has she named them? No. And what of the minister? He's tied up with his own girls, but he's added Annie to his prayers. Says he'll come visit when his man gets back from some errand at Ingersoll's. Dear God, Henry says. Four of them afflicted now? It's spreading, Edward says. The following two days, February 26 and 27, 1692, will prove pivotal as these are the days the girls begin naming the names. Not one, but three women will be accused by the end of these days. Tituba, the enslaved indigenous woman in the Paris household, is the first accused when Betty and Abigail cry out against her. The woman who has cared for them as much as their own mother has who will go on to profess much love for them during her examinations by the magistrates. Born in South America or the Caribbean, Tituba may have been an Arawak or a Carib. Paris likely purchased her during his time in Barbados, where he tried to run his father's sugar business before his return to the Massachusetts Bay Colony, where he had for a time attended Harvard College, his academic career cut short by his father's death in Barbados. To say Samuel was a poor businessman is quite an understatement. The man seems to never quite settle into a profession at which he will be able to succeed. At any rate, he had Tituba in Barbados, and he brought her to Boston in 1680 or 1681. Except while he served as temporary minister in Stowe in 1685, Samuel remained in Boston working as a merchant, 
until men from Salem Village approached him about being the town's minister in 1688. When he accepted the call in 1689 and moved his family to Salem Village, he brought Zitiba with him. It's unclear when he acquired the man known as John Indian, a man of undetermined indigenous background, and for a time, a third enslaved person, an African-American teenage boy, also resided in the parsonage with the Parises. However, Paris recorded the boy's death in March 1689. While Titiba's exact origin is unknown, Olenji Breslau's book, Titiba, the Reluctant Witch of Salem, posits one plausible theory and is very well worth a read. On February 27th, Anne Putnam Jr. accuses Sarah Good of bewitching her. Elizabeth Hubbard, meanwhile, names both Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne as her, her tormentors. In a dramatic incident, Elizabeth claims to be followed by a wolf, which is supposedly directed by Sarah Good, or may even be the shape-shifting Sarah herself. In 1692, Sarah Good is an impoverished woman with no permanent housing or reliable income. But things hadn't always been that way. Born Sarah Solert in about 1654, she was raised by respectable parents in Wynnum. Her father, John Solert, was likely French by birth and may have been Huguenot by faith. He worked as an innkeeper and left behind a healthy estate. But he, he took his own life in 1672. And unfortunately, Sarah was left in the lurch, inheriting only three acres of meadow. So Sarah married Daniel Poole, who promptly ran up an eye-watering debt, which Sarah was forced to pay from his meager estate after his death, leaving Sarah destitute. She next married William Good by 1683. William was a weaver and a laborer who never seemed to stay employed long. He and Sarah had to sell off the meadow to pay additional debts owed by Sarah's first husband. William Good's origins are unknown, but he had two children with Sarah. The first, Dorothy, was born in about 1687. The second daughter, whose name is unknown, was born in December 1691. And we have much more with, about Dorothy in our episode with Rachel Chris Doan that you can refer back to learning what happened to Dorothy after the witch trials. At the time she was accused, Sarah Good was in the habit of going house to house seeking charity. She evidently was given something at least once by the Parises, but she left the house muttering, raising suspicions. Sarah Osborne had caused a scandal when, following the 1674 death of her husband, Robert Prince, she married Alexander Osborne, her young indentured servant. She was also involved in a dispute over her husband's first estate with his kin, Thomas and John Putnam, who were the executors. By February 27, 1692, Osborne had been sick in bed for at least a year, had not been able to attend worship at the meeting house all that time. All three accused women were markedly different from the New England Puritan ideal of what a woman should be. All three were outsiders in key ways. Titiba was most clearly an outsider being indigenous in a period when Massachusetts English settlers were at war with the Wabanaki Confederacy, an alliance of Algonquian-speaking peoples who had chosen to ally themselves with the French over the British. But Sarah Good from Wynnum was also a relative newcomer to Salem Village. Being indigent placed her further outside the norms of the community. Requesting charity was itself risky business in the age of witch hunts. As people who refused to give what was asked for felt guilt, and then resented the one who asked. If something shortly went wrong for the refuser, say a child took ill or a livestock died, perhaps, then the person who refused the gift would suspect the one they'd refused was seeking revenge through witchcraft. Aren't there some things in the record where those who were turned away for a favor or a handout were mad when it was refused and they wished something ill on the refuser? 
There are a number of cases exactly like that where somebody say, uh, lastly, Sarah Osborne had transgressed social norms by wedding a younger man and indentured servant and by failing to attend meetings on Sundays. With three women accused of witchcraft, the witch hunt was ramping up and would soon be in full swing. We'll cover the first arrests and examinations in our next 101 episode. Thank you for listening to Witch Hunt. We hope you enjoyed today's stories. Join us every week. Have a great today and a beautiful tomorrow. <laughs>